Welcome to Real Chemistry. In this episode, we're gonna do a practice problem of a cooling curve for water. And what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be calculating the heat that is released from a system of water as it cools. So if you haven't watched heating and cooling curves, go ahead and check that out first. That goes over a little more conceptually what we're gonna be doing. And this is really just a practice problem. We're gonna be using phase change calculations as well as heat capacity calculations. So I also have a video on both of those. It might be useful for you to check out my video on heat capacity and also my video on enthalpy, heat, and phase changes. So what are we gonna be doing in this problem? Well, we're gonna look at the quantity of heat released when nine grams of water cools from 40 degrees Celsius to minus 20 degrees Celsius. And this is pretty similar to a problem that I did in the heating curve a video, except for now we're actually cooling the sample down instead of heating it up. And you'll see that that has a critical difference. So step one says break apart into the heating phases and the phase change steps. So there's two different steps here, or two different types of calculations we're going to do. One is when we're cooling water from 40 degrees to zero degrees, that's a heat capacity problem. On the other hand, once we get to zero degrees Celsius, that's now a phase change problem because at zero degrees Celsius, water freezes. And so there we're gonna use a phase change calculation. Finally, when we cool ice from zero degrees to minus 20 degrees Celsius, we're once again gonna be dealing with a heat capacity calculation. So we gotta break this up into three steps. And the very first step is we're gonna be going from 40 degrees Celsius to zero degrees Celsius. So that is a heat capacity problem. So it's heat capacity for step one. Now, step two is at zero degrees Celsius. And at zero degrees Celsius, we're gonna be going from H2O, that's a liquid, because we were cooling from above zero, to H2O, that's a solid. That's a freezing step. That's a phase change. Now, as we continue to cool, we're once again going to be dealing with a heat capacity problem. Because in this step, we're going to be going from 0 degrees Celsius, the temperature of our ice, all the way down to minus 20 degrees Celsius. So once again, this is a heat capacity problem that, down here in the last step. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're now going to go step by step doing each of these calculations. And the very first one, like I said, is a heat capacity problem. And what I'm going to write down is the delta T. And the delta T here is for going from 40 to 0. So we're dropping in temperature. And if I do final minus initial, that is 0 degrees minus 40 degrees, I'm going to get out a negative 40 degree change. So that's my temperature change. I'm also going to write out my heat capacity. What heat capacity do I want to use here? Well, I'm dealing with liquid water. So I want to use the heat capacity for liquid water. And I have all the heat capacities for water listed in this bottom right corner. Liquid has a value of 4.2 joules per gram degree Celsius. So I'm going to write equals 4.2. And that has units of joules per gram degree Celsius. Okay, so now I'm pretty much set to do my heat capacity problem. Where I know that Q, and I'm going to call it Q1 because this is the Q of our first step, is equal to mass times our heat capacity times our delta T. And our mass in this case is 9.0 grams. And our heat capacity is 4.2. And our change in temperature is negative 40 degrees. I'm going to put that in parentheses just so I remember that negative sign. And when I calculate that Q, that's going to give me out negative 130.2 joules. So that's the heat released in step one. As that water cools, it's giving off heat to its surrounding. How much heat? 130.2 joules. Now let's go to our phase change. The most important thing we need to find, uh, figure out for our phase change is what enthalpy I should use. So here we're going between liquid and solid. And that means that we need to use the enthalpy of fusion because that's the fusion associated with melting or freezing ice. And this enthalpy of fusion listed here is when we're melting ice. That's an endothermic process. But here we're freezing ice. And so since we're bringing those water molecules closer together, that means that it's actually an exothermic process and we're not gonna use positive 6.02 kilojoules, we're gonna use negative 6.02 kilojoules. If that seems confusing for you, go ahead and check out my video 
on enthalpy and phase change, where we talk about that in more detail. So we're going to use negative 6.02 kilojoules per mole. So now we have our enthalpy. And if you recall, our equation for calculating our um, heat release during this phase change is just Q is equal to N, that's the number of moles, times delta H, whatever our correct delta H is. And I'm going to call this Q2 because it's the heat for step two. Here we have a little of an issue because I was given my mass of water in grams. And so that means before I can plug it into that equation, I got to go from grams to moles. And so we go with 9.0 grams times one mole. And the molar mass of, of uh, water is 18.02. So we divide it by the molar mass, it's 18.02 grams. And that gives us out moles, which is about 0 0.50 moles. Now we have the moles of our water. And so what we're going to do is we're going to multiply 0 0.5, that's the moles, times our delta H, which is negative 6.02. Okay, if you have a problem with remembering these signs, another thing you can just remember is that when we're doing cooling curves, that gives off heat for every step. And when we're doing heating curves, that takes heat for every step. And so in a cooling curve, all your Qs for each individual step should be negative. And so if you ever get confused about should my enthalpy be positive or negative, just remember it's a cooling curve, should be negative. And when I multiply those together, I'm going to get negative 0.301 kilojoules. So notice in my top problem, I got joules out because my heat capacity is in joules per grams degree Celsius. And my second problem, I got kilojoules out because my enthalpy has the units of kilojoules. All right, let's go to step three. Once again, a heat capacity problem. And in this case, my delta T is going from zero degrees to minus 20. So... If I do final minus initial, negative 20 degrees minus zero gives me negative 20. So this is decreasing the temperature by 20 degrees. So I have a negative 20 degrees Celsius change. What heat capacity should I use? Well, now that I've frozen water, that's what I did in step two, I need to use the heat capacity for frozen water or solid. And if I look at that down in the bottom right corner, I'll see that that is two, or I'm sorry, 2.1 joules per gram degree Celsius. So I have 2.1 joules over grams degrees Celsius. All right, so now I'm ready to plug everything in to my heat capacity equation, which is once again, mass times heat capacity times delta T. And when I do that, I'm gonna do nine for my mass times my heat capacity, which is 2.1, times my delta T, which is minus 20 degrees Celsius. And when I add all those together, I'm going to get out, or I'm sorry, when I multiply them all together, I'm going to get out negative 378 joules. Joules because my heat capacity is in joules. All right, I'm almost done with the problem. The very last step, after I apply the heat capacity and phase changes in each step, which is what we just did, is add all the heats together. But I'm going to have to convert to the common unit. And kilojoules is usually the easier one to do. So if I go from joules to kilojoules, it's just dividing by 1,000 or moving the decimal three times. One, two, three. And that's because there are a thousand joules in a kilojoule. So what we get for our top step is negative point, is negative 0 0.130 kilojoules. That's heat for step one. Step two is already in kilojoules, so we're good there. Step three, this is Q3 down here, needs to go to kilojoules also, which means I move the decimal over three times and I get negative 0 0.378 kilojoules. All right, so I have my heats for each step. Now I need to add them all up. So Q total, the total heat for this whole process is just equal to Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3. And when I do that, these are all negative numbers. So my very first Q from Q1 way up here is negative 0 0.130 plus a negative for my heat 2, which is negative 3.01, plus a negative for my last step, which is negative 0 0.378. So each step of this process is giving off heat. And so that's why they're all negative. And so my Q total is going to be all those numbers added together. And when I add them all up, and I take into account sig figs, I get four kilojoules. So that's my final answer.
So we only have one sig fig, sig fig for our temperature changes, and that's why we round to one sig fig there. And what this tells me, ooh, that should be negative four kilojoules. What this tells me is that if I cool water, nine grams of it, from 40 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius, that gives off four kilojoules of heat. Whenever you're doing a heating curve, that takes heat. Whenever you're doing a cooling curve, that gives off heat. And so if you can think carefully about the phase changes that you're going to be going through when you're heating or cooling, you just have to break apart this problem into heat capacity steps and into phase change steps. And when you add all those heats up, you get the total heat change. If you have any questions about this video, please ask them below. You can also subscribe to receive updates about future real chemistry videos. Thanks for watching.